Hi everyone, I'm Lucy Middlefort. This is the live stream today focused on architecture and preservation here at Monticello. Um, I'm the architectural conservator here and I have Brandon Dillard with me here to moderate and ask some questions. Thanks Lucy. So for starters, can you tell us a bit more about who you are and what you do at Monticello? Sure. sure. So as I mentioned, I'm the architectural conservator. So that means I come from a materials background. I think a lot about how, how historic building materials work together, um, how to prevent damage to them, and how to make sure that any additional materials that we use here that might be modern are not going to cause future damage in the, um, to the historic building fabric. Um, I have a multifaceted job here. Sometimes I'm working hands-on um, on the preservation of this house. Sometimes I'm uh, overseeing re broader restoration projects. Uh, I do a fair amount of research to make sure that we are interpreting Monticello as accurately as possible. Um, and and um, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a job where I get to use my hands, but also, uh, but also sit behind a desk. It's a mix. So how did you get into this line of work and how long have you been doing it? Yeah, so I'm actually from Charlottesville. Uh, I've always been interested in historic architecture, but this isn't my first career. Uh, initially, I went into a digital field and I, um, I, I was interested in architecture enough to apply to architecture school as an undergrad, but then didn't pursue it because I felt like it was I was too young to commit to it at an early age. Um, but in that digital job, I really missed kind of having a hands-on component in my work. And so I um, realized that there was in fact a field called architectural conservation um, where you get to work on historic buildings, but also work with your hands on them. And so I went back to grad school about um, five years ago. I've been here now two and a half years. So I'm still one of the many, uh, one of the pretty new people here at Monticello. So Monticello is an architectural icon. It's a UNESCO World Heritage Site. It's even on the US nickel. Can you tell us a bit about why this house is so important? Sure, so Monticello is incredibly important for many reasons. The fact that it's a UNESCO World Heritage Site puts it on par with like the pyramids, the Great Wall of China in terms of global significance. Um, but it's not only it's not only significant because of its architecture. Its architectural significance is derived primarily from the fact that uh, when Jefferson designed this building, it was unlike much else around. Jefferson grew up in this area. He um, he uh, went to Eastern Virginia for many years as a child, and then he went to the College of William and Mary, where he would have seen a lot of Georgian architecture, which is neoclassical, but it's neoclassical of a sort of different flavor. And so in putting together the designs for his house here at Monticello, um, Jefferson really took neoclassicism in a bit of a different direction um, and in many ways uh, set the precedent for, um, for this form of neoclassicism, which takes literal design elements from classical Rome and Greece through, um, through enlightenment ideals like simplicity, uh, symmetry, order, and reason. Um, he was making Monticello as an embodiment of those ideals, um, taking specific elements from Greece and Rome, um, where, which were the foundation of democracy and introducing them to a new country. It's great, we have a question from online. Rick, Rick wants to know a little bit about the paint on the wood on the exterior of the house. Oh, um, yes. So we have done paint analysis on the, uh, on the exterior of the house, places like the, like the uh, entablature. Um, and the colors that we present right now are the historic colors, it's an off-white. Um, Another example of uh, information about the exterior paint is the, the columns. If you've been to Monticello in the past, you may, um, you may remember that 10 or 20 years ago, we had white columns on the west front. And uh, through paint analysis, we actually learned that those columns were not actually white during Jefferson's lifetime. And we know that because, um, because the, our paint analysis showed that that between the plaster or stucco render on the columns and the first coat of white paint is actually quite a thick layer of soot. And since we know that those columns were not, uh, the render was not applied until 
quite close to the end of Jefferson's life, it's highly unlikely that those were ever painted white. And so that's one of our recent restoration projects was removing that white paint. So what does it mean when we say Jefferson was an architect? Good question. Uh, Jefferson was an architect, but he was self-taught. He was an amateur. He never went to architecture school. Um, he was incredibly inspired by many books of architecture from, um, from Italian Renaissance architect Andrea Palladio, as well as James Gibbs um, and uh, Robert Morris. He got his inspiration from many books of architecture, uh, architecture that were um, neoclassical um, Renaissance Enlightenment Enlightenment books, and he used those pretty literally um, in in the design in the design of Monticello. But not only Monticello, he also um, designed several other buildings, including the Virginia State Capitol, um, the University of Virginia, several public uh, private homes in this area. And then he also played a role in um, deciding which designs for architecture would be chosen in Washington for our federal for our federal architecture. So in many ways, you can argue that Jefferson played a role in setting the precedent of, um, of, of neoclassicism being our national architecture. So who actually built Monticello? Very good question. Um, Jefferson does, may have designed it, but he did not build it. Uh, he did employ uh, a number of white master craftsmen, um, people like masons, plasterers, painters, um, uh, there's more. Um, but they were not the people who, who did the vast majority of the labor of building this home. Um, Jefferson, at any one time, relied on the inst institution of slavery in order to build this house. Um, he owned, at any one time, um, around 130 people and their labor really went into building this house. Um, some of them became master craftsmen in their own right. So um, it's really an interesting place because Monticello is, a, is quite the contradiction. It's a place where Jefferson was presenting freedom and democracy as ideals. Um, and yet that was very um, quite in conflict with how he lived his day-to-day -day life. The construction of Monticello took more than 40 years and it had two distinct phase, phases. Can you tell us a bit more about that process? Yeah, so, so there were um, two quite different designs for Monticello. The first, was, which we call Monticello One, the other we call Monticello Two. Monticello One was a quite formal vertical Palladian structure. It had a pedimented roof. Uh, it had a two-story west portico. Uh, which we're not actually sure the second story of that portico was ever constructed. Um, and and it, it, followed, it followed Palladio's design quite, quite literally. Um, the design changed very much after Jefferson returned from France. He was there for five years. And after he got back, he changed the design um, considerably because he adored the architecture that he saw in France. And that architecture was also neo neoclassical, but um, you know, again, a different flavor of neoclassicism. So, um, so the Monticello II incorporated some big changes, including the iconic dome that you see on the west side of the of the house. It lowered the roof line so that uh, so that it did not overwhelm the the dome itself. So it introduced um, it introduced what we call a terrace roof, which is kind of a zigzag shape. Um, which allowed the roof to sort of sit snugly behind the, the height of the, the dome and not overwhelm that. Um, it also, Jefferson also doubled the size of the house in, in Monticello too, uh, adding a whole suite of rooms on the east side of the house um, to accommodate many, many more people being here. And he also, uh, this is my favorite detail of the change, that he changed the positioning of the windows on the second story such that from the exterior, they actually look like they're part of the first story. Um, so what you end up with in Monticello too is something that is less of a formal uh, Palladian villa and something that looks more like a sprawling French mansion. It's, it's a blend of types of neoclassicism. A couple of members of our audience, Linda and Natalia, want to know if the yellow paint color behind you is original. Very good question. Yes, it is the original color. Um, the story of the dining room paint color is, is 
interesting and illustrative of our process here because we're trying to present Monticello as closely as possible to how it looked at the end of Jefferson's lifetime in the 1820s. Um, and it was believed for many years that this, uh, that this room was a, a light blue. Um, so, so what basically changed is that we, uh, our microscopy technology advanced over time. And so our Susan, uh, sorry, our pain analyst, Susan Buck, who has been uh, working here for many, many years um, and helping us determine what are the original paint colors, she was able to identify an even earlier coating, which is this chrome yellow. It's a brilliant yellow um, and uh, quite an exciting room to be in. So you've talked a little bit now about how the process has changed over time. Monticello has been open to the public as a museum for almost 100 years. Can you tell us a little more about how things have changed in that time in terms of what the building and landscape actually look like to visitors? Absolutely, yeah. So when you come to visit Monticello today, um, it looks very different from, uh, from how it would have looked 100 years ago in some key ways. Uh, one of those is that there is just much more of an emphasis on telling the story of Monticello as a working plantation. It's not just a home. Um, so one of the big projects recently has been uh, uh, really making Mulberry Row, which was the which was the main street of the plantation and where people uh, lived and worked uh, in the enslaved community, um, making that more of a living place. So that has involved reconstructing several buildings along that along that row. Um, and preserving others. So, so we have a, uh, a cabin that is representing the home of John and Priscilla Hemmings. We have uh, the nailery reconstructed, and we've also uh, restored the textile workshop. And um, so that is a really big difference um, here in Monticello and a, way, a change in how, we've, um, how we interpret the place. Physically on the, the main house, there have also been many changes. I already mentioned the um, the dining room color. I've mentioned the west front columns. Um, we also have reconstructed the Venetian porches on the south side of the house. And um, then also the terrace railings are different. So if you came to Monticello a few decades ago, you might recall uh, a Chinese inspired design of, for the terrace railings. And that was a Jefferson design. However, we did not have any uh, evidence that those that that terrace design was actually ever installed here. So what we did have was a second design for the terrace railings in Jefferson's hand in combination with some drawings or illustrations of Monticello from toward the end of Jefferson's life. And in those illustrations, it show, they show um, the, something that looks a lot more like the second design, which is a picket or paling type fence um, and so based on these pieces of information, you were able to restore uh, the terraces to what they actually would have looked like during Jefferson's life. Rosanna is curious if there's a specific time period in Jefferson's life that we're shooting for regarding the interior of the house. Yes, yes, there is. We are, we are aiming for some, somewhere in the 1820s and Jefferson died in 1826. So, we're shooting for roughly the end of Jefferson's life then. Scott is wondering if you have any questions that you would have liked to ask Thomas Jefferson about this house. <laughs> uh, that's a good question. I don't know. I would have to think about that. Um, I, I would love, well, I'd love to know how he chose um, the particular the particular designs from these books that he loved so much, like why why this particular uh, motif in the parlor, why why these elements in the dining room? I think that those are interesting. He he clearly saw a connection between these physical elements of classical design and um, and the ideals he was pushing forth. But I'd love to hear more about why those particular ones. So there are a lot of different words that get thrown around in your field that can be confusing to people outside of the field. Can you explain the differences between conservation, restoration, and preservation? Sure, uh, this is a good question, near and dear to my heart. Uh, in this context, conservation means strictly taking care of historic building materials or objects uh, by stabilizing them, protecting them for future generations, making sure that no damage gets done to them. 
Restoration is a bit of a different philosophy. It's, uh, it involves conservation, but it then takes it a step further to try to present whatever object or place um, as if it was in an earlier time, like at a specific point in the past. So uh, as I've mentioned, Monticello, we aim to restore this mountaintop to look as closely as possible to how it looked in the 1820s. Um, that's, a that's a decision that every historic site has to make. Are we, uh, is our philosophy to restore it? Are we conserving it? That kind of thing. And then preservation is more of an overarching term that simply implies that we are assigning value. We believe that there is inherent value in historic uh, building, building fabric or, or objects, and also um, that you take, uh, take some steps to, to preserve it. So what kind of projects are currently underway while Monticello is closed to the public? Yeah, this is a weird time for everyone, but there are some silver linings. One of those is that we've been able to accomplish some restoration work pretty safely here. Uh, the first is the restoration of the wall color in the parlor. And that is a project that we've been looking forward to doing for many years, but it's logistically challenging to do because the room itself um, not only do people walk through it so many times a day, but also the room had um, so much furniture and so much art on the walls that it's difficult uh, simply to find a place to store that while we're open. So being closed has given us an opportunity to restore this color to um, its original color, which was a subdued light gray. And it really has proven um, to, to be an excellent backdrop for not only the art, but also the architectural woodwork in the room, which is um, quite ornate and beautiful. So that's one. The second project that we've been working on, the reason that we're in the dining room today, is because we have conservator Andy Compton here. And he is working on the composition ornament above the window in the dining room here. Um, he's, he's worked on many projects here at Monticello in the past, but, um, and in many rooms on composition ornament. Um, but the process essentially is to bring back the detail of this of this ornament. And composition is essentially a putty-like material that can be uh, molded to suit any type of um, mold that you might have. Um, it's made out of chalk and linseed oil and hide glue and tree rosin. And when you heat those materials together, you get kind of a soft putty-like material that you can uh, press into molds and cast cast ornament out of. And Jefferson chose designs for each one of these rooms um, to, to put these, these uh, motifs or elements specifically uh, that you can actually see when you go to, to ancient, um, go to Rome. Those still exist on temples in Rome. So anyway, the process that Andy is going through is he's removing some of the layers of the modern paint over top of this ornament because over generations this ornament has been painted many 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 times and as you paint over time you start to lose the detail on the ornament so he's removing some of the modern layers of paint he's being very careful not to touch any of the jefferson era finishes um, but by in doing so, we're gonna have a lot more detail on this ornament than we've had for many, many years. And he's also sculpting areas of the, of the ornament that may have been lost over time. Um, and he's sculpting it out of a, out of a um, let's see, out of a modern material that is easily discernible to be modern by future researchers. And he's also applying it in a way that's gonna be reversible. And that is key to a lot of the work that we do. We really want to make what we do reversible in case in a couple generations, uh, people wanna make different interpretive decisions about, about how, how we present Monticello to the public. Um, so it's a very exciting project and we're really thrilled that we're able to make some good progress even while we're closed. So how does your department ensure that the mountaintop is shown as historically accurately as possible? We rely on a lot of different kinds of information. I've already mentioned Jefferson's designs. Jefferson was a, an amazing documenter. We have incredible lists of materials that he was ordering, when, that, when they were ordered, when they arrived. Uh, those kinds of details that we are incredibly lucky to have at a place like this. We also have visitor accounts. Many people came to visit Monticello and they wrote their, uh, wrote ex wrote their experiences down. Um, 
And so those, those types of experiences are incredibly helpful. Like for instance, in, in um, the drawings of the terrace railings that we were able to consult. Um, but we also have written accounts that can give great detail, like talking about the green floor in the entrance hall, things like that. Um, so those are really important pieces of information. We also rely a lot on our archaeology friends. We have a great team of archaeologists here at Monticello who are excellent at um, helping us locate particular um, areas of the built landscape, such as um, fence post holes of the Mulberry Row fence that we are uh, re reconstructing portions of um, so that we can, when in reconstructing the fence, we know exactly where the original fence post holes, but we can avoid putting our reconstructed fence posts in the exact same spot. We want to leave those alone. Um, they're also helpful in finding, um, finding the exact foundation footprints of buildings that are no longer around. Um, and, then, and then the final piece of information that we use a lot of is just physical evidence. I like to call it above ground archeology, span <laughs> what we do, but um, pain analysis is one of those ways where we um, do some very uh, minimal excavation of, um, of surfaces to figure out how, how they were finished originally. So Mar is wondering if there are barns and similar structures around the plantation to store produce and equipment. Yeah, yeah. Um, Jefferson owned a lot of land and he had quarter farms, uh, including um, uh, one of them is Tufton that's coming to mind first. Um, and we don't have an extant barn there, but we do have a house that was, it's a stone structure where Thomas Jefferson's grandson actually lived for a while as the manager of that quarter farm. So there are many little little outbuildings that we um, that we manage that are not necessarily right on the mountaintop. So throughout Monticello, there are a number of architectural details that reveal Jefferson's thoughts and ideals, like the large and numerous windows, and of course the famous dome. Can you share with us one of your favorite examples of Jeffersonian architecture and what ideas it conveys? Sure, I. it's very difficult to pick favorites, but I, I really love the entablatures. So I've already mentioned some of them, the interior entablatures, like the ones that Andy's working on at the, uh, where the wall meets the ceiling. The woodwork in these entablatures is just truly incredible to think that it was all done by hand. Uh, and then the elements that are shown are directly um, brought over to Virginia from Rome and Greece. So it's kind of an incredible connection to an ancient world uh, and, and one that has really influenced our architecture today. Elizabeth is wondering if you could talk about the architectural relationship between Monticello and Poplar Forest. Mm, yes, yeah. So Mo Poplar Forest, for those of you who don't know, is, is, is Jefferson's summer home or retreat of some kind. Uh, it's very similar in some ways, but also quite different. A Poplar Forest is an octagonal house. Um, and as we know, Jefferson loved to be octagon. Um, it's a much smaller house. It's got a central room with then exterior, uh, I guess, rooms encircling a central a central octagon. So many of the motifs you find at Poplar Forest can be found here, but the, the overall design is different. So the Thomas Jefferson Foundation that owns and operates Monticello today works hard to care for this historic site now, but has the house always been well looked after? Mostly, yes. We are incredibly lucky here. Obviously, the Thomas Jefferson Foundation, which currently owns it, has, um, has owned Monticello's almost 100 years since 1923 and has been dedicated to the pre preservation of, of, the, of the whole mountaintop. Um, but before that, the Levy family owned the, owned the mountaintop for almost, almost 90 years through multiple generations, and they were really excellent stewards of Monticello. Um, they introduced some small modern conveniences like bathrooms, which have since been removed, but, um, but by and large, we are incredibly indebted to them for, for keeping Monticello in such great condition. There were a few um, small lengths of time where, where Monticello was not quite as well taken care of, like right after Jefferson's death or during the Civil War when there was a, an ownership dispute over, over the place. But really, by and large, we are incredibly lucky to have it in the condition that we do. So lots of folks at home are uh, taking on more than usual and working on projects around the house. 
Uh, what kind of day-to-day -day maintenance of historic architecture is critical at a place like Monticello? Yeah, we have a team of multiple people who are working day in and day out all year round to maintain uh, Monticello and keep it in very good condition. Uh, many of the things that we're doing are things that homeowners do all the time. Uh, clean out gutters, keep painting. Um, we have some specific things that we do like reglaze windows when they need it. Um, we uh, apply log oil to the terraces and any other exposed wood that needs protection from water. Um, but we also just do a lot of condition assessment, walking around, looking for, uh, looking for problems that arise before they get bad. And for that, we also rely uh, on the eyes and ears of our guides and security um, who are really excellent at letting us know when anything looks amiss. So speaking of things uh, being amiss, a lot of people do unfortunately know that water can be quite damaging to a home. Um, does Monticello have the same potential problems with uh, leaks, floods, frozen pipes, that kind of thing? Sure, we are not exempt. I have to say, uh, I, I spend less time worrying about floods up here because we're luckily on a mountaintop, but we are definitely prone to leaks. And some of the design features that Jefferson included here make it particularly prone to leaks. Uh, we have amazing skylights here. Uh, we also have that terrace zigzag roof that I mentioned, which, um, which it is amazing for reducing the profile of the roof, but also creates gullies for water to flow down, which um, have been prone to leaks in the past. So I do think about that. I also just think about um, the materials that we use here uh, in order to promote um, the, the egress of water. If it does get in, we wanna make sure that water has a way out. So that means using breathable coatings. It means um, choosing mortar for when we do repointing of the brick exterior, choosing a mortar that is soft enough such that the moisture that leaves the wall goes out through the mortar rather than the brick, uh, because we wanna, we wanna really protect these original bricks surfaces. All right, here's a great question from online. Uh, Brian wants to know if you have a restoration wish list. <laughs> uh, yes, I absolutely do. Uh, at the top of my list is actually stripping the, um, the many, many layers of impermeable uh, finishes from the all-weather passages that go on the, on the cellar, from the cellar of, of Monticello to the exterior. Um, we believe that those cellars or that all-weather passage was painted white, but it was likely a lime wash, which is really breathable and good for the masonry. Um, so many of the coatings on there are not breathable at all, and one of the, it's a big project, but I'm hoping to tackle that one day. So one, one final question, Lucy. What is your favorite part about working here at Monticello? <laughs> Again, it's very difficult to pick favorites. I have uh, incredibly talented colleagues. It's a beautiful place to go to work every day. Um, I have to say, if I had to pick one thing, um, the views from the mountaintop are incredibly gorgeous all the time, but being able to see them from the roof is extra special. So uh, I have to say, the view from the roof is an incredible experience and I'm incredibly lucky to experience it. Um, I think that's all the time we have today, but I really appreciate everybody joining this live stream. Stay tuned uh, on our Facebook page for, for information about next week's live streams, which are going to be focused on music, and I believe there's actually going to be a live performance. Um, and then also, if you're interested in more details about preservation here at Monticello and what happens behind the scenes, please follow us on social media at Preserving Monticello. Thanks so much for joining.